Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here uh, to our seminar on crisis, on how it impacts individuals and organizations. And I'm excited to be able to present this information to you to take the knowledge of what's going on in the world. We're going to kind of look at some issues and things that are occurring. And then we're going to ask the question, so what? What can we in the faith community do about this? Um, one of the references, and we will have this for you here uh, at the desk on your way out, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, Secret Service and the National Threat Assessment Center uh, recently published some information that they looked at 28 different incidents uh, that have happened uh, in the United States and came up with some key research on what to do about it. So this is what's happening in our world right now. You know, crisis is happening all around us. We have things like terrorism, <laughs> mental health issues, um, workplace violence, uh, domestic violence issues, uh, school-based violence. I mean, it's just every day there's not a day that you can't turn on the news and not see something happen. As a matter of fact, wasn't there, somebody just told me, because I've been buried all day, didn't something just happen today? You two had a shooter, I think shooter. looked like a uh, domestic. Not a terrorist, I think. And that happened at YouTube? In the headquarters, yeah. Wow. In California. You know, so let me just ask you this question. Who, is it the professionals that are the ones that first experienced the initial impact? Or is it people like us that's out in the world that first experienced what's happening, such as these issues? It's the people out in the world, right? How many of you have ever had CPR training? Okay. Now, of those that have had CPR training, how many of you have had to administer CPR? One out of the class. So why is it that we want everybody to be trained with CPR? In case something happens, right, to be able to go and do something about it. Well, that's kind of what my perspective is on this also. Let's just look at one year. Last year, on April 10th, there was a 53-year-old husband of a special education teacher who entered his estranged wife's classroom at elementary school, fired 10 shots, killing his wife and an 8-year-old student. He also injured a 9-year-old student before killing himself. That's April 10th. All of these, by the way, had something to do with school-based incidents. On May 1st, a 21-year-old student fatally stabbed one student and injured th uh, three others on a university campus. And after his arrest, he claimed to be experiencing auditory hallucinations. On August 28th, a 16-year-old gunman who had planned to attack his school after being suspended opened fire at the public library instead, fatally shooting two and injuring four. After his arrest, he claimed he was upset that he was not liked at school and was generally angry. <coughs> September 13th, a 15-year-old gunman killed one student and injured three others at high school, from which he had been suspended over concerning notes he had gave friends. After his arrest, he claims his attack was to teach others a lesson about the consequences of bullying. On November 14th, after killing his wife the previous day, a 43-year-old gunman shot his neighbors, then fired at random persons on his way to an elementary school possibly searching for his neighbor's son. While the school was on lockdown, the gunman fired shots that penetrated the outer walls, injuring some. The attacker was ultimately killed by law enforcement. All told, he shot and wounded at least 10, killed five, including two of his neighbors and his wife. On December 7th, a 21-year-old former student who dropped out twice entered his former high school and killed two students, then killed himself. He may have been suicidal. So let me ask you a question. What can the church people of faith do about issues like that? What do you think most people would say? Pray. What else? Counsel. Counsel. Provide support and encouragement. Provide support and encouragement after the fact, right? Well, if we let's look at these 
six or seven different instances, could there have been something that we could have done before these incidents occur? Preventatively, right? Doesn't the scripture say we, that we have everything we need unto life and godliness? Doesn't it have all the answers for every issue that we ever face in our lifetime? Aren't we supposed to be salt, preservative? So aren't there things that we can be doing to take our faith and not just take our faith theologically out into the world, but also to incorporate our faith into our lives and our walk? Because ministry isn't some time or some place for us to go to do ministry. Ministry is where we are at all times. You know, we have some former military here. When the president would come on board a naval vessel, they would not pipe the president of the United States has arrived. They pipe the United States of America has arrived because the president represents the country. What do you think about that? We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Now, analogies always fall short because God's imminent and he's present, okay? But when we show up, the kingdom of God is arrived. He's already there. But for lack of better explanation of analogy, we're ambassadors of a foreign kingdom because we're living in the world, but not part of the world. So we need to be representing the kingdom in all aspects. That means we ought to be striving that we think like God, that we see as he sees, that we hear as he hears, that we speak as he speaks, and that we do as he does. And as I review scripture, I always saw that Jesus did good first, took care of people's needs, and then he talked about the spiritual truth. And he always used that which was around him. That ought to be our model. That ought to be the way that we're living life. So I think there's something more than we could do here than simply pray. Now, if we're going to go to a government organization and we look at any of these and we say, hey, we want to come and help you, their perspective of us is you have nothing to offer me. You're, you, there's nothing here, but I'm going to show you there is something that's here. This is published article from the U U.S. Secret Service on mass attacks and public spaces. Again, you'll have it out here on your way out. This was just published in March 2018, so extremely relevant. When we look at these mass attacks, there were 28 incidents uh, during which three or more persons were harmed. Uh, carried out in public places within the United States. Now, on this map, there are 29 locations that are shown as one incident, which took place in two different states. Okay, so there's that's where they spread, kind of all over the country, right? And here's what's happening. If you were those individuals that were there when it happened, your world was violated. You were stressed, you were in a crisis, that crisis may have become a critical incident. I'm going to explain a little bit about that at the end here. But your life has forever been changed if you were one of these people and you've gone into this pit that you now got to make sense. What just happened to me? This was not normal. My apple cart has been sh shaken up. If you can imagine uh, a five band equalizer, okay? Whenever anybody is in crisis, in the first 24 to 48 hours, you are impacted physically, emotionally, and cognitively, or how you think. 72 hours or greater, you then have spiritual and you have behavioral issues at surface because it takes time for them to set up. So when you're functioning as a chaplain, you're kind of an emotional and spiritual paramedic that go in to stop an arterial bleed. You're not there to do the surgery in the immediate, okay? Now, the type of chaplaincy that you do, the training and the issues and the skills that you need is contextualized to the environment in which you are serving. So if I'm a law enforcement patrol chaplain or if I'm a coroner chaplain or I'm a district attorney chaplain or probation or if I'm hospital or if I'm hospice or if I'm any other of the myriad types of chaplains, each, concert, each environment that I serve in dictates the issues that will arise in that context. And the issues that arise and how they arise dictates what type of skills that I need to deal with those issues. So let's bring it back into the sacred realm for a second. 
Y'all are familiar with missions, right? And sending out missionaries, okay? Don't we, don't we have our missionaries before they're sent contextualize themselves to the people group that they want to serve? Don't they have to learn the culture? Do they have to learn the language? Okay, do they have to learn the do's and don'ts? Well, I'm gonna to propose to you that we're missionaries where we are, not necessarily going to another country. So a chaplain has been invited into an organization to fulfill its mission. So if I'm in a law enforcement realm, I have to learn their language. Do they have their own language? Do they have their own culture? Do the issues that I face in a patrol vehicle, will I ever face those issues if I'm in a hospice? No. No. So if I'm gonna be there, don't, it doesn't it make sense I need to understand how to operate in that environment? Well, does our faith go across all of those environments? Absolutely. But are you equipped with the secular skill set to be in that environment? That's what came to me. I was a pastor for a number of years in Orange County, California. And we started sending people out for disaster-based chaplaincy. That's what we first got involved with. And I started realizing, because of my, my background, that the people we were sending from the church, although well-meaning, they weren't equipped necessarily to be in that environment. It's a hazmat situation. You got biological waste. You have the potential for bloodborne pathogens. So how do you deal with hazardous materials? How do you decontaminate? You're gonna be working with multiple agencies across multiple jurisdictions. Do you understand about incident command system, which is a command and control operation that can roll up or roll back down to work in large scale uh, disasters. Uh, you know, it, it's things like that. But if I'm inside a hospital, I gotta understand the clinical operations of a hospital. I need to understand about patient care, palliative care. I need to understand about uh, 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 precautions as well inside the hospital, because not just to keep the person healthy, but also to keep yourself healthy. But do I need that if I'm, uh, in probation, and I'm working with the staff of those that are overseeing those that are incarcerated. I don't need it. So when I started investigating all the programs that were out there, everybody was saying that you need to take our chaplain program because ours is the best. Okay, well, you may be very well the best, very well for what context of service. It's not a one size fits all. However, there are some core foundational fundamental concepts in chaplaincy that are horizontal across all chaplaincies. That became a course called practical chaplaincy, it's 48 hours. Then you have to contextualize, you're either first responder or you're community based. And there's verticals in each one of those. And each vertical is another 40 hours of training for that vertical. And then you have issues that are common like depression, anxiety, panic attack, uh, substance use, um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mood disorders. There's certain things that you'll come across. So you need to understand the issues. And now that you understand the issues, you need to be equipped. What do you do about those issues? So that's kind of the big picture that we're now embedding inside the degree program here at Grace, adding to the theological grounding and foundation that you have with your Lord, because our relationship with the with God and with the Spirit that dwells within us is the reason we're doing chaplaincy in the world, and it ought to be predicated that we develop our relationship. Which I'm so excited to hear about what Dr. Norris is doing with the discipleship and mentoring program, because we need to be strengthening our relationship, our intimate personal relationship with the living God, because that's who empowers us and is calling us out into the world. We're just simply adding the skill sets to deal with it so that when you come across people that have experienced any of these issues, you're going to be able to come alongside them and the agencies would want you to be there because they actually send their people to the same training that people are going to get here in the degree program. That's pretty exciting, okay? So when we continue looking at this, the resulting loss of 147 lives and injuries of nearly 700 others had a devastating impact on our nation as a whole. 
you know, and as things continue to, to ripple through our communities, those charged with ensuring public safety strive to identify methods to prevent these types of attacks. But who's taking care of them? You know, they're trained to put on the physical body armor to be safe, but not necessarily are they trained on putting the spiritual, psychological, and, and emotional body armor to protect themselves because when they are in operation mode, they have to bury it. Problem is they may never deal with it. And when you go, and so I'll explain a little bit later, from call to call to call, that starts to develop into cumulative stress. And there's all sorts of issues that come off of that. And then you end up having post-traumatic stress injury. Sometimes you have what's called moral injury, and that could end up even in dying by suicide. So there is a progression to stress that's insidious that we can do something proactively to mitigate and reduce the potential exacerbation of the stress in the lives of our first responder community. So they're taken care of and their loved ones are taken care of and the staff is taken care of. And as, we, as they serve and protect, as they go out and serve the community, we're able to go out with them into the community. So think about this for a second. I'm a person of faith, and you all have heard about separation of church and state, right? And how everybody says you're spiritual, stay away from it, right? And a lot of times you hear the spiritual side say, you're secular, stay away from me. Well, I'm sorry, but isn't somebody supposed to be on the bridge connecting both sides, right? <laughs> Isn't that what our walk as a believer ought to be? Well, just remove the word believer and put chaplain in place. The way we stand in the middle of the bridge and connect the sacred with the secular is secular skill set. Add it to the our reason why we're there. Spirituality, our faith, our, our, our love of Christ. So... As I mentioned, the National Threat Assessment Center just put this together from Secret Service. They examined these 28 incidents to find key themes. So here's what they found. Half of the people, half of these incidents were motivated by a personal grievance related to workplace, domestic, or other issues. Communication, right? Is that an issue that we can do something? Oh. Absolutely always. Is, is there some way that we might be able to be used in a secular environment to reduce potential escalation? Could we get trained in mediation, right? Can we help people just to be that person that stands between them and help them iron out their differences? If we're able to do that, won't that potentially have an impact on these incidents from never occurring? Because they had somebody that could stand in the gap. That's a secular skill set. Here's something else they found. Over half had a history of criminal charges, mental health symptoms, and illicit substance use or abuse. Can we do something about that? Absolutely. We're, we can be in the court systems. We can be working with the victim advocates. Uh, we're actually, uh, I work with a, a chaplain in Riverside, California, that we helped establish initial MOUs, and he's the lead chaplain with the Riverside District Attorney's Office. So literally they have chaplains that were trained with 120, 150 hours of training, credentialed, and then submitted for oral interview to the district attorney, chosen, background checked by them, and then another 40 hours of victim advocate training. And they're literally in the Family Justice Center in Riverside, working with the victim advocates, working with the victims themselves and the district attorney. And they want <coughs> want them there. I remember there was one issue that I was down in San Diego, you know, one person in Riverside, and I think one person out in Murrieta or someplace, and the DA said, where's our chaplains? We need them. And we all converged because of an issue that surfaced there. That's phenomenal. Law enforcement chaplain in a patrol car at domestic violence, full uniform, bulletproof vest, badge, representing the sheriff's department. Yet I'm able to pray with the domestic violence person that's experiencing the issue, trying to get away from their spouse. The think about that, separation of church and state. Lemon versus Kurtzman, three-pronged test, I mentioned it earlier. Have to have a secular purpose, can neither advance nor inhibit religion, so you gotta 
serve everybody and the government can't be entangled with you and you can't usurp the government's authority. As long as you do that, you there's no violation of separation of church and state. There's a difference in philosophy of ministry from being a pastor and being a chaplain. People don't leave the mission field because of differences in theology, generally. They leave because of differences in philosophy of how to go about doing ministry. So I was both a pastor and a chaplain, which means I need to understand when do I put the pastor hat on, when do I take it off, and when I put the chaplain hat on, and when I take the chaplain hat off. It's a different method of doing ministry, and that's what we cover in our training. All had at least one significant stressor within the last five years, and over half had indications of financial instability in that time frame. I love this quote. The spoken word belongs half to him who speaks and half to him who listens. Okay. Part of being a chaplain is having empathy. It's one of our six core values. Okay. Here's my definition of empathy. It's someone else's pain in my heart, which means I need to be able to listen more than I speak. Now, I'm putting a hat on as a former pastor. Do pastors like to be silent? They like to direct and tell what to do, right? A chaplain doesn't operate that way. A chaplain wants the other person to verbally throw up on them, to get the poison of the pain out of their system. So they have to be empathetic and walk with them. Let me give you an illustration. When a crisis happens, and I'll cover this a little bit later also, that person's world has been rocked. We already talked about that. They've been thrown down kind of into a pit. So what a chaplain does, which I believe every believer ought to be doing, is we need to scaffold them and shore them up artificially. The scaffold are the interventions that you learn in being a chaplain. Everything inside here is a pit of chaos, it's crisis. Okay? We scaffold them so they don't hurt themselves, so they don't hurt other people, and other people don't hurt them. And then what we do, which I think is very much like the paraclete does with us, we turn and we walk with them, empathetically empowering them to take back control. I'm gonna say that again, empathetically empowering them, meaning we're not gonna do for them, we're gonna provide opportunities for them to do for themselves because they've lost control. And if they're dependent on us, that's harming them. We want to empower them for them to realize they're still in control. And we're gonna walk with them for a period of time to release them so they're either restored to some new normal, or if they still need help, then we refer them for higher levels of care. So if I was in a healthcare environment, I would say to you that chaplaincy provides a continuity of care model that takes somebody pre-incident through the incident and after the incident and can walk with them all along that path based upon where they are. They're gonna tell us what they need from us. And then we simply provide what they need, but not do for them, but help them to do for themselves. Because if you're in the crisis, like a disaster, we're gonna be there and we're gonna leave. We're not gonna be there long-term. But we are gonna be there long-term if we're first responder chaplain, that's responding with the first responder team there. So while we're there, we're gonna work with that first responder to take care of the community <coughs> needs. But now that we left and we're with the first responder, we're gonna check and make sure the first responder's okay. And if they're not, because we have a relationship we're with them long-term, then we might have some potential counseling later, depending on if they want that from us or not. So disaster-based for community, you don't need counseling training. You need crisis intervention training. Disaster-based chaplaincy, if you're a first responder chaplain, you need both. Again, the environment dictates what you need to learn about. So <clears throat> with these people, over three quarters made concerning communications or elicited concern from others prior to carrying out their attacks. On average, those who did elicit concern caused more harm than those who did not. 
So if we're salt in the world as a preservative and we are observant because chaplains are proactive and reactive. So proactively, we're seeking ways to provide support to others because that's the heart of the chaplain. So if we're going with one of these individuals, could we maybe have them be able to talk with what's going on inside them? And we're trained to be able to listen to them and maybe get them the help. And if we did that, could this have been precluded? I would <laughs> say yes. So when we look at where things happen, I'm going to kind of go through <laughs> these really quick. 13 of them were in businesses, nine of them were in open spaces, four in the schools, three in transportation, and two in churches. Does that kind of speak about everywhere? So imagine, you know, our Lord had 12 apostles, right? How many now are believers with just 12 people? Do, do we have 12 people in here that's willing to learn and go out into the community to make a difference in their community? I would hope so. That's what our calling is. We can make a difference. It's a different way of looking at ministry. When we look at the weapons, most were using firearms, some vehicles and knives. Of the 23 who used firearms, at least 10 possessed weapons illegally. Two of those 10 were minors, the others were felons, had protective orders against them, or had some other factor that should have prohibited them from owning a firearm. When we look at the timing, it took place throughout the year and occurred every day of the week. Over half took place between seven and three. Rare week between seven and three. At work, right? Or at school. So when we look at the assessment, it could happen at any time of the day and everywhere that all of us are currently located, right? Half of the violence ended within five minutes from when the first shot was fired or the person was harmed. 15 minutes or more was about 29%. Five to 14 was about 21% of the time. That was the duration of the attack. When we look at the end of the attacks, uh, it ended in violence, either because they departed the scene or they died by suicide. For the remaining violence ceased as a result of law enforcement action, and a few ended when firearm or vehicle became inoperable. We look at the resolution, eight died by suicide. Others were taken into custody or apprehended in another location. Four were killed by law enforcement. When we look at gender and age, all the attackers were male. They ranged from 15-year-old high school to a 66-year-old retiree with an average age of 37 years old. <laughs> Half of the attacker, attackers had a history of substance use. Uh, it included alcohol, marijuana, um, as the two main ones. We look at criminal charges and domestic violence, that's what DV stands for. Uh, most have histories of criminal charges beyond minor traffic. Uh, those charges included both violent and nonviolent. Seven of the violent had charges related to domestic violence. And in addition to the seven, two others were subject of domestic disturbance call uh, during which no charges were filed. When was the last time you heard a pastor from the pulpit preach on domestic violence? Or address that as an issue? We spent in our chapel course, I have uh, some materials. I, we spent about an hour to two hours on this from multiple faith perspectives, Jewish, Christian, Catholic, Protestant, um, to show what happens within the faith community with regard to domestic violence. Uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, I went through seminary, I got my master's in divinity from Talbot. They never told me how to do a temporary restraining order, or even what that was. You know, I, I taught, when I, when I was doing the pilot for our law enforcement chaplain course, that I wrote for uh, California law enforcement for the state. I had 50 people in the class in one of our pilots, one of our first ones. And I asked the question, these were pastors. How many of you recognize that you're a mandated reporter? All the hands went up, got to put it down. How many of you have taken a mandated reporting course? 
two hands out of 50. At that point, I changed my class because I incorporated mandated reporting as part of the course itself because there are mandated reporters. And as a chaplain, you will become, if that's the direction, you will also be a mandated reporter. But also as a chaplain, you have confidentiality and privilege communication, just like an attorney or a doctor or a husband and wife. As an ordained, licensed, or commissioned chaplain, that your ecclesiastical endorsement agency has that in writing on how they deal with confidentiality privilege communication. That's at least in the state of California, I'm still learning Texas laws. And California is actually written into the California Evidence Code, uh, 911, 1217, 31, 2, 3, 4. That, those are the codes dealing with confidentiality and privilege communication for clergy. Because as a chaplain, you are considered clergy by the state. When we look at mental health issues, Two thirds of the attackers experienced mental health symptoms. Most common were psych related to psychosis and suicidal thought. I represent Living Works. I'm a master trainer. Uh, they have trained over a million people worldwide in suicide intervention. They are on the Suicide Best Practice Registry. There's a series of courses that are progressively deeper that takes them from suicide talk, which is just even saying the word suicide. There's a stigma and there's a lot of people afraid of even bringing the word up because there's a myth going around that if you say it, you're putting it into the mind of somebody. That's a myth, that's not true, okay? So just be able to use the word suicide in a conversation. The next class is called Safe Talk. What Safe Talk is, is John is having uh, some suicidal ideation. And he comes to Don, and Don's been trained in safe talk. And Don knows how to talk with John and gets Don to say, you know what, I really could use some help. And Don says, great, I know somebody to bring you to. So he brings him to me who does the intervention. That's called safe talk. All that is is connecting another individual with the care that they need. Applied suicide intervention, and the first class is we can actually do that online. It's like an hour and a half. Safe talk is three to four hours. Applied suicide intervention skills training is actually learning the suicide intervention model. That's a two day class. And then there's a class after that called Suicide of Hope, which is the case management of individuals after they have attempted uh, suicide. So there's a whole progression through all of it. Um, and I represent all of that except for the case management simply because I haven't taken the training yet, but I will. So these issues for psychosis and other, uh, what would generally be uh, talked about as psychiatric issues. When somebody is depressed, does the scripture talk about depression? Yeah, was King David depressed? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you, you know, I, I've had people in, in the class, remember I told you, Physical, emotional, cognitive in the first 24 to 48 hours. Spiritual and behavioral take time to set up, so it's 72 hours or longer before you start to see abnormal symptoms. <coughs> How many times have you seen inside the church that they only talk scripture? And I believe in that. But did you know that if somebody's depressed, one of the first things that ought to ha happen, they need to go see a medical doctor and be examined because there could be something organically going on in the brain chemistry that could be treated with medication. But if all, now did God make medicine for us also? Yeah, yes. he did, okay? So I believe that we've got to look at the whole person when we deal with somebody who's in crisis, not just one component. I had a pastor's wife, when I started sharing this in one of our classes, got so convicted because she, she had all these women coming in, in to see her and she only talked about the spiritual, which absolutely needs to happen. But what about the emotional, the cognitive, the behavioral, and the physical aspect? She totally ignored all that. So let me throw something out to, to you. Have you ever known somebody who had an anxious thought? Yeah. 
maybe some of you, right? Have, have you ever experienced or know somebody who experienced it that the anxious thought was so bad it made them sick, physically sick and wanted yes. to throw up? Did, did that change maybe their perception of how they were thinking about issues because mm -hmm. they were getting so overwhelmed? Did that in turn change their behavior? Mm -hmm. I guarantee you there's a spiritual component there as well. Now, no man is an island. I'll share this a little bit later. But when one individual is compromised because of a crisis, every relationship that's attached to them is also compromised. I call it relational trauma. I'll explain that to you a little bit later. So not only do we need to holistically treat the whole person in the way that God created us, but we ought to also look at all the relationships that's attached to that person because they're also compromised. And they need help. Can one person do it all? No. But can 12 men change the world for the sake of the gospel? Yeah. yeah. So why not take what we're learning here out into the world and add to what we're already doing in our ministry another aspect or level and go someplace that generally we're not allowed in? When was the last time you heard a pastor get called by the police to go to a domestic violence scene? <laughs> Yet I'm in the patrol car with the officer and the deputy on, arriving on getting the call to go to the scene. I go places as a chaplain I never was able to ever enter into as a pastor. There's a whole opportunity that's being missed. And I'm saying, no, no longer. My time here coming to Grace literally is an answer of over a decade prayer. Because every single time I've met anybody attached to a seminary or a Bible college, I have told them, you have got to teach chaplaincy there so people leave here understanding it and know how to use it so they can make a difference. They talked about having a stressor in the last five years that led up to the attack. So let's look at them. Family. Romantic relationships, engagement, divorces, breakups, all of these types of things, family and romantic relationships, some form of a stress may have occurred. Now, do you guys know anybody who has any of these potential issues going on in their family right now? And I just see a show of hands. Look, Keep your hands up. Look around the room. These are five stressors, evidence-based research over what happened this last year on 28 mass casualty incidents. And everybody in this room raised their hand to one of these stressors. Let's look at the next one. Personal issues. You know anybody who has unstable living conditions, physical illness, or other disorders? Can I see a show of hands? Look around the room. <coughs> How about work or school? How about, you know, somebody who's been fired or suspended? Grievances? Being bullied, disrespected? Real or perceived gossip? How about this one? Contact with law enforcement. You may or may not have that one. But four out of five? Under, this is what's happening in the world. So just put this into context with where you live and you work. How would you feel if you were one of those people and you knew there was an opportunity that somebody else could have come alongside to have helped empathetically walk with them, empower them to get back control because the issues that they're facing in life have put them into this pit? We can make a difference. That's my point. So are you like me when you see this? Are you kind of overwhelmed? Perhaps, perhaps now, you may have had some prior exposure that makes you less overwhelmed about this. You may have a high degree of resiliency. So because you've experienced, you're able to bounce back. You may have had an instance that the dosage or the dose relationship, that it wasn't somebody close to you, but somebody that was, that you don't know that it was an acquaintance, because if it was somebody that was close to you, it'd have a bigger impact than somebody that was an acquaintance. All of those kind of make up how you would respond, and each person is unique. 
Another reason why Chaplin needs to they listen so that they learn the uniqueness about the individual. So let me ask you, what if you could get grounded with solid theological training and be equipped to do something about all of this in your local community before, during, and after an incident? Would that be exciting? Yes. Yeah. I think so. And that's exactly why this is a winning combination. Why the combination of Gray School of Theology and Care Force is a winning combination because we take solid theological training and add purpose and secular skill set and focus and teach you how to take your faith and make it active in the local community through chaplaincy. That's powerful. There's not a place you can't go as a chaplain if you understand how to do chaplaincy properly. There's a lot of people that put the title on without the training. And they're the ones that give people a bad taste of chaplains and spiritual people in the workplace because they don't understand. They have good intentions, but they don't understand. So here's what came from my time as a pastor. Chaplaincy is a bridge ministry. It's the bridge between the sacred and the secular, between care and missions. So that gives us four quadrants to operate in. We started off in disaster-based chaplaincy, which is that bottom secular mission focused, quadrant two. Okay. I was teaching on a Wednesday night when this came to me. And I recognized all these people that were sitting listening. And I started thinking, again, I was raised Jewish, as I mentioned earlier. There's two blessings over the bread. There's blessings over the special occasions of the year. And there's bless the daily blessings of the bread. The rabbis consider it more miraculous in God's daily blessings than he does on the special occasions of the year because of God's presence and imminence on a daily basis. And it clicked. Don't ask me why, but it just clicked. Why are we waiting for all these people were getting trained and they were waiting for these major events like the Katrinas and the Myanmar's and things like that. They were waiting for these major events to occur. But we have people that are experiencing crises every single day. They lost their job. Their loved one came down with cancer. The kid's on drugs. Isn't that a crisis in that person's life? Just like the major events. So I said, well, we got all these people that have had all this additional wonderful training. Can we use them inside the church? So here's what ended up happening. If you look up at that third quadrant, it says care and sacred. I Don't ask me why, but I was both the care and the missions pastor at our church. Normally that's two different people. We pushed the care of the body care down to the small groups. We trained all the small group leaders to take care of the care needs in their small groups. Okay? So if a death occurred, that small group took care of its members in that small group. Now, things may sometimes be more than what that small group leader could handle. So we took our chaplains and we attached six small groups to every chaplain. And when the phones got turned off at night, the phones were forwarded to the chaplain corps to respond. They always called me also because I was a care pastor. And if I didn't respond, which was not the norm, I would always try to respond. But for some reason I didn't, they would come and fill me in on what happened. Okay. We had a husband and wife chaplain couple hold a 13 week lost crisis, grief and trauma ministry for anybody that had experienced a death. We advertise that in the local newspaper. So now we're going to the secular side to say there's a support group here for you to come to. You're all familiar with Grief Share Church Initiative. Mm -hmm. That's what we were using. We had divorce care before you divorce and divorce for kids and all that stuff as well. Then on the mission side, we had the small groups adopt the missionaries that were overseas. So every small group provided missionary care. As the mission pastor, I would send the chaplain for that small group with the mission team, but their role when they went was to do in-country <coughs> missionary care. 
because who does that who does that missionary have to talk to, right? And our chaplains were equipped to be able to deal with those issues. So when they came back, they would come to me as the mission pastor, let me know what was going on. But then they went back to the small group and explained to the small group how the small group could better support the missionary. All of that sacred side, everything above, happened because we were training people to go out of the church into the local community. So when we're looking at care and secular, we're providing a care force for the secular community inside of business and government and education and schools and law enforcement, everywhere that they could go, we were equipping people based upon who they were in Christ and what God was calling them to do. That's significant. So here's what happened. You equip for sacred care and you do certification for secular purpose. Gosh, that kind of sounds like grace and care force which is what our nonprofit is. That's the exact same model, but we're able to go four different directions in two different planes. Does that make sense to you? That's our model. So now when we look at what a crisis is, somebody's going through in their life and they have this side of their normal. This is what their normal is. It's unique to them, okay? So an incident happens, and we're going to call that incident a crisis, okay? Something that's out of the normal. That does not mean that they are impacted. It's not yet what's called a critical incident. The definition of a critical incident is when a normal person has had an abnormal event happen, and that abnormal event now has overwhelmed them to the point that they're not able to function or cope. Now it's a critical incident. At that point, that's when that person goes into the pit. So now they got to say, what just happened to me? I have to make sense of it. So this is when the chaplain enters in. So when the immediate happens, the chaplain's response in the first 24 to 48 hours is making sure physical, emotional, and cognitively they're stable and they're sure enough. We will walk with them. We're going to do all the different interventions. We need to stabilize them then they need to tell us what happened. How, how, how do they react to what happened? What's going on with them, right? Then most people don't have a clue of what normal looks like after a crisis has happened. This caused a critical incident. So we have to help them understand what normal looks like, okay? And then once they understand what normal looks like and what abnormal or dysfunction looks like, then we need to help them to cope. So we are resource intensive. The chaplain helps provide resources to empower the person to take hold of, not do for themselves, with the, process, with the hope of providing immediate, as close to the scene of the incident as possible, and an expectation of providing hope to them with simple and brief interventions. Okay, that's what crisis intervention is about. So it's a time for the individual in their uniqueness to reorganize their life around what just happened and make sense of it. It's not, as I like to put it, and coined a couple terms, it's not the time for us to therapize, and it's not the time for us to sermonize, right? That's later, if ever, okay? As the person comes out and is anything long term, they have now learned how to incorporate the crisis into their life. So what was normal now is a new normal. So they've readjusted as a result, but sometimes they need some further assistance. This is where crisis counseling comes in. So we don't do counseling when somebody's in crisis. We do crisis intervention when they're in crisis. Counseling is later, okay? And when we do crisis intervention as a chaplain, we have to be multiculturally competent because we're providing this to all faiths while not imposing our faith on another. Our God wounds people into a relationship. He doesn't force himself on people to be in a relationship. Everybody is on a journey. God wants all to be saved, but not all are saved. 
So we respect where people are, even if they have no faith. We're still going to help them because as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, we want to model as Christ would and love them into the kingdom. And we love them into the kingdom through action. Now, we may not be the person who ever sees that happening, but we certainly can be the person that God uses to water their seed. And the next time somebody else comes along that they're in crisis and understands this, they're one step closer to the possibility. Because I got news for you guys and gals, I know we all know this. We have nothing to offer anyone. And we can't save one soul. That's the Holy Spirit's job, not ours. But we certainly can be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And as ambassador of the country that we belong to, properly represent the country. So we don't do something that precludes someone else later coming on board with that individual and doing what God's called them to do. That's a different, not necessarily a difference in philosophy, but I'm explaining a little bit of that. So when we look at what happens if we're talking about first responders, but I'm going to tell you here, everybody in this room is a first responder. Because if you've ever experienced a crisis, what I'm about to explain to you is the biology of stress. You are going to go through what I'm talking about. I'm just using law enforcement or first responders as the example to illustrate the point. Okay? This is a common human condition. This band here is between my the two things is what's normal. When you are in a crisis, you become what's called hypervigilant because you want to protect yourself. This is where fight, flight, or freeze occurs. You're getting ready to deal. That the terminology is that which is causing you stress is called the stressor. Okay. So you're getting ready to deal with the stressor. Okay. Now, if you're a first responder, what happens is you're living your entire shift in this hypervigilant range. And you're going from one call after another, and each call has different levels of harm or potential crisis. You can go to a homicide. You can go to a bank shooting. You can go to an identity theft, right? Different levels of stress. What happens is when these individuals get off work and they go back home, your body has neurotransmitters. There's hundreds of them that jump the synapses of your neurons. One of them is called like serotonin, okay? And that communicates the dendrites between the nerve endings that allows the nerve and the muscles to function. So when you first get to a crisis, the body dumps as a whole bunch of neurotransmitters are dumped. And you have fine motor skills. you got high cognition, good visual acuity, and good hearing. But if you're going from one call after another, at some point in time, your body doesn't have any more to give. So now the neurotransmitters are no longer being able to be produced because it hasn't had time the body to replenish. So now you go to gross motor skills, you lose visual acuity, you become foggy brain and your hearing goes. You follow this? So what ends up happening is when they get back home, their spouses have not been trained for the environment that they're in. And they can't share what they're involved with down here because of secondary trauma to their spouse because they're not equipped to deal with the issues. Or maybe there's a legal reason why they can't do it. So now they get back down here and they say, well, what do you want to do for dinner? I don't know. And they become the couch potato. They go through that cycle, right? And then what ends up happening is the people up here, they become adrenaline junkies at work. So the body desires that which it's lacking. So what they try to do is replace it. How do they do that? Well, they start having behavior that's bad. So they might start buying all the motorcycles or the speedboats or all the toys when they can't afford it. So now they get into financial debt. So what do they say? I got all this debt I got to take care of. I'm going to go back to work to do overtime. Yeah, like that's good. To take care of the debt that they just created down here, right? And then they come back down here, and the wife, again, what do you want? And they start to get, or the spouse, forgetting because it could be either or the wife. They start to get frustrated with their, their first responder. And the first responder now says, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go back to where people understand me, right? So they're bouncing back and forth, up and down at all the peaks and troughs. This normal band 
they never come back to it because it takes 18 to 24 hours for the body to replenish, but they're on 12 hour shifts. And if you're in fire, you're four tens, 24 hours. That's significant. So that does a lot of physical harm. So what ends up happening down here, now they start to get uh, promiscuous. They start to have multiple partners up here. They start to have multiple marriages down here. They start to get cumulative stress because the issues that happen up here are never dealt with up here. And they don't want to talk about it down here because there's unit cohesion up here. And they don't want the others that are depending upon them to have their back to know. And there's a code of silence that happens up here. Do you see how destructive this is? Okay. This is the biology of stress. We all go through this, but we're able to deal with reducing it because of these crisis intervention techniques. So when we look at what happens in the body, the spinal cord delivers signals to the body. So our saliva flow decreases, our blood vessels constrict, our outer extremities get cold because the body's pulling everything into the core to take care of and uh, prevent any issues from happening. The stomach and the gut do a dump. I, I, I know in the military, it's a very embarrassing thing when you have somebody in a military uniform and they may urinate or defecate and they don't know that that's a normal reaction to stress. So if I was a chaplain, I wasn't a military chaplain, I was a corpsman. If I was, I would want them to know, you know, that's a case for me. Go ahead, well, I'll cover you up. Let's go get this taken care of. And so that's a normal reaction. Why? Because if the body is getting ready to take care of the stressor, it doesn't need to digest food. So it does a dump or the person throws up. That's normal response. But they don't know that. So now they have shame and they have guilt, which is unnecessary for them to have. And simply have somebody come alongside and tell them, oh, it's okay, we're going to get taken care of. You know how much that de-escalates what's going on inside them? <laughs> That's huge. So here's the concept. Stress is a perception of reality. It's a perception that you have your access or inability to access resources. If you are not able to get resources, they're blocked. So you got something that's stressing you, and you know the resources are there, but you can't get them because there's a block, there's a wall there. Your impact's huge. Versus you have a stressor and you have a large amount of resources, the impact's smaller. Does that make sense? It's a perception. So some, when somebody's in the pit, they're overwhelmed. They may have the resources, but they're unable to access them because they're so overwhelmed. So when somebody is anxious, be calm, you talk some. You don't get hype. You don't have a lot of nonverbals that say you're stressed out, right? So you don't look, you don't want to bring you into the equation because it's not about us. It's about the other person. It's about what they need to be healed. Isn't that what our Lord wants to do is to heal us, to restore what a practical way of being able to do that through chaplaincy. So this is where we start to talk about relational trauma. Now, I'm going to show you something simplistically. It's called a genogram, okay? But I'm using it a little bit differently. A genogram is a visual picture that you're, you learn in counseling to look at what's called the family system, okay? So a square box is a male, a circle is a female. Whoever comes in to do the counseling you will put a square inside of a square, or you put a circle inside of the circle, and that's what's called the identified patient, the person that you're actually counseling. And what you do is um, you look at who all the relationships are, and you start drawing it out in a visual picture. So I could look at a picture. It's one of the first things I do whenever I do counseling, is I want to sit down and say, tell me about your family. You have a mom and dad, were they married? How, you and your spouse, have you been married before? How many kids have you had? I want to find out. Were there any miscarriages? Were there any alcohol or substance abuse? And literally, I have a picture within about an hour, hour and a half of all the relationships and everything going on inside the family. I can look at it. That, I use that all the time when I'm doing crisis intervention because I'm looking at all the relationships. 
So I'm gonna show you a simple family that has a, a husband and wife single marriage that have a son and a daughter. And I wanna show you the impact of one person is impacted for a crisis and they become dysfunctional. I want you to watch what happens to a simple family, okay? So you have a husband and you have a wife. That's what's called the marital dyad, okay? Now they have kids. So the husband becomes a father and the wife becomes a mother, okay? So now we have two people, each with two roles, okay? Now, you have a son and you have a daughter who are a brother and a sister, and it's called the sibling system. Combined, that's the family system. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, now, every line that you're about to see is two relationships. It's from different perspectives. So, a husband has a relationship with the wife, the wife has a relationship with the husband. The father has a relationship with the mother. The mother has a relationship with the father. So from a person to person, there's two, rela two relationships. From a role perspective, there's four relationships. Are you guys starting to see this? Okay, now, same thing with the sibling. Okay, let's count the lines up. Let's say it's the husband. How many lines are attached? One, two, three, plus both systems, four, okay? Times two, that means eight relationships are impacted. Now, if you took one, two, three, four, and you look at the roles, you multiply those roles, there's 16 roles that are impacted. This is just a simple family inside of with one person being impacted. Let's look at the external relationships. The family system has relationships with other systems. The marital dyad has relationships. The sibling has relationships. Each individual has relationships. If you look at all of these different relationships, externally and internally, can we also look at this within the workplace? If you work in a department and you've had an issue inside the department, you're impacted physically, emotional, cognitive, spiritual, and behavioral. 21st, 24, 48 hours, physical, emotional, cognitive, 72 or later, spiritual and behavioral. And every one of those relationships are also impacted in those five dimensions. This is what the simple family. Is there more that could be done? <clears throat> I believe so. So, these are just a few of the organizations that we represent. Armed Forces mission is by Major Chaplain Ken Coons, who's with the 80th Training Brigade. Uh, he works for a two-star general. He oversees 40 states in the United States. He's a good friend. People joke when you see the two of us together. We look like we're born. We actually, I was just back in Atlanta, Georgia with him and uh, one of his board members, John Avery, who's a retired sergeant from Salinas Police Department. We went through our master instructor training with California Peace Officer Fairness Training. We walked in and the gal looked, because we looked very similar, the gal thought we were brothers, literally, because we looked so similar. So we uh, Christian Crisis Care is. Uh, run by one of my chaplains, Shelly uh, Pinamaki. Uh, Christian Crisis Care goes in and helps churches to set up the initial foundation for establishing a crisis response chaplaincy program in the church that later plays into all of our other training. Uh, Law Enforcement Chaplain Consortium, Peace Officer and Training. You can read all of these are nationally and internationally known organizations. National Center for Chaplain Development is one of our ministries as well. These are some of the courses that we provide under Care Force, of which these courses are being embedded into the degree. So you can kind of get a flavor for some of the stuff that will be included in the degree program. Not all of that, but some of that. So there's more to come. 
So I just believe that what we have here, Grace, is a winning combination. And I'm very thankful that they allowed us the opportunity to be able to partner with them you know, and show that uh, in this endeavor to bring this type of training into the chapel ministry and to be able to provide a degree program that we're just so thrilled and excited about. So my presentation is done, and I'd like to open this up for questions or comments. I can, I can give a drink to a fire hose, I know. I can give a drink to a fire hose. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you're new to Texas, so I'm still, I guess I'm still fixated on uh, the Texas job market. If um, chaplaincy isn't known yet, how it compares. I, I have no idea, but again, what type of chaplaincy are you looking at? Are you going to go into military? No. Hospital? Um, hospice. Or hospital. Yeah. Okay. I, again, I, I would... Are interested in the community aspect. Okay. Community aspect, as you had indicated, you want to look for your vocation and avocation to be identical. There could possibly be some community aspect, but I'm just looking at a place where you can also have an income, your two best bet will be hospice or hospital. And those are dependent upon the hospital group that you're going to go to and the hospice agency. So my encouragement to you is to do some investigation before you proceed and start calling and meeting uh, people in hospital chaplaincy and also hospice agencies and find out what the requirements are uh, and what the job market looks like. Because the Master of Arts chaplaincy was new, like um, before I was introduced to chaplaincy through the hospice and uh, the hospice patient. Mm -hmm. So, um, from with that avenue and with the hospital uh, program, it's the divinity degree. Depending on the agency's requirements. Okay. Not all hospice agencies require you to have a master's in divinity to be its chaplain, as I mentioned. In California, I know a couple of chaplains that don't have a master's in divinity, but they are hospice chaplains and they're paid by the hospice agency. So your best bet would be to do some investigation. And if you are focusing on hospice, I would probably, with what you just shared, call the hospice agency. Did, did they have a chaplain while you were, your mom was in, in your yeah. hospice? Mm -hmm. Uh, ask if you can speak with that chaplain and find out what his requirements are. And if he has, did he have his own Do you know? Yes, we have more than one. Okay. So, um, yes, there was only one that was a, that was a pastor. Sure. But he was working on okay. a seminary degree. Th there are uh, regulatory agencies for hospice most of the time in each state. So I would do some Google research on hospice in Texas uh, and then find out what the requirements are and look for hospice chaplains to do some research on it. But that, that would be your best bet because it's sort of the job market is a good question. A good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. There's an organization called Good Shepherd Counseling Center. Have you ever run across them? I have not. Uh, that seems to me strikes that balance with the involvement really well from what little I know about them. And there are a number of them uh, here in Houston and other uh, municipalities. And I just wondered if you come across that kind of issue their travels that perhaps share what kind of uh, earnings that I, I only know about the chapel. Rare. It is very rare. That's I guess the marketplace ministries is one of those that have to stretch that into the work time, whereas you know, well, Good Shepherd. Yeah, marketplace, marketplace chaplaincy actually has contracts with companies mm -hmm. to provide chaplain services embedded in those companies. That's, that's different. I, if I'm understanding, because I'm not familiar with this, I would assume that they are Christian-based biblical 
and people are coming to them to receive counsel. A chaplain is attached to an organization and is going to others, not having others come to them. What kind of like, oh, I'm sorry. It's kind of like the principle that Dr. Anderson mm -hmm. had talked about. The world is, needs, is coming to the United States and getting really down with having out a year worth of finances to come to school. But Grace's focus is exactly opposite, to take the training out to the world. And it's exactly what we've been doing since 2002. Another one that's similar to the Shepherd Johnson said, a lot of them uh, appear to have a credential licensed profession. Yeah, they've gone through state license, yeah, state license. which is different. Because when we say the word counseling, you have to be very careful because there are legal implications to that word. We do biblical counseling, prophetic counseling. Uh, there is an organization called NAIC, which is a National Association of Nuthetic Counselors. <coughs> Dr. Jay Adams is the person that's in front of that. Uh, our nonprofit has had a relationship with NAIC for many years. I, I have I use their materials. We have a 70 hour nuthetic counseling course that through the way we set it up, they have allowed us to submit people that have come through our classes in both introduction and marriage and family nuthetic counseling to sit and get a proctor with me to do actual counseling. And then they get a certificate with Link to be a nuthetic counselor under Link's auspices. But biblical counseling, Nuthetic counsel, counsel of Luke, Luke, the scripture says we're supposed to be confronting one another in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the word of the that's used there. We've lost the art of confrontation, I think, in biblical circles because it's taken on the word to confrontation tends to be very confrontational. People don't like that, but that's not what biblical confrontation is. Biblical confrontation is one of the most loving things you can do for them because it's helping the other to be built up in their faith to become more like Christ. Because we're supposed to remove the speck out of our eye before we remove the plank out of our brother's eye. The body itself ought to be counseling one another in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because we love one another and we want one another to be the, our eyes and ears so we can all become. Like, we've lost that, I think, a lot in Christianity. Um, biblical nuthetic counseling is prescriptive. We're saying the scripture says this about your situation. This is what you ought to do based upon the scripture. A LPCC, what you're talking about, is a state licensure that falls under mental health scope of practice and works. That's why. Be very careful when you say you're a counselor because there's legal implications for you using that terminology. So if they're operating under that type of thing, it's not the same as what you're talking about. Okay? And again, people are going to them. They're not counselors that are going out into the community and coming so alongside an individual or organizations that we're counseling. People are coming to them. A good question. Thank you. Another one comes to mind while you mentioned that one called hand care, cancer care, and it uh, does somewhat the same thing, but uh, there's no state. Yeah, involved. you're talking about, I think, a what I would call a peer support organization. Those are most likely individuals that have dealt with or had a loved one that dealt with cancer mm -hmm. that have come through it now. They have had some period of time for healing, and now they have what I call post-traumatic growth through the situation, and they want to do something to help others that are now experiencing the same issue, so they can talk as a peer. I work with Dr. Nancy Bolt Hanrod and the Counseling Team International out of San Bernardino. <clears throat> she is a huge advocate for what's called helping triad, triad of care that works with mental health professionals, peer support, and chaplains working together. The mental health community does not know what to do with spirituality. And the faith community have nothing, they don't want anything to do with the mental health community. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody has to stand on the bridge and connect the sacred with the secular and the secular, secular with the sacred. And I firmly believe that as believers, we're supposed to be doing that. I did, most of you may have been doing chaplaincy your whole life and you just didn't realize it because you haven't been trained and you did, I, you know, I got all sorts of alphabets too back in the day. I could care less about it, right? But the world looks for that. And that's why I have all the alphabet too. I don't like a title. Chaplain, a believer, a person of faith. You know, it's how we ought to be living. Our model is Christ for us that's in this room and for those that are listening. Um, and I want to become more, I want to think like he does. I want to see as he does. I want to have the heart that he has. I want to do my actions as he does. But I, I, I'm a fallen man, and I'm going to fall short of that. But if you're my brother and sister, I hope that you love me enough to point those things out to me so I can become more like him. We're supposed to be doing that. So to me, that's what the counseling is about. My uh, wife was a breast cancer patient. She did not survive. But she did participate in the Steve Administration yes. program. Is that kind of where? Well, you again, it's a it's show an example. Stephen's ministry is inside the faith community. It's not going out to the world. But I, I'm very familiar with Stephen's ministry. It's very much uh, a lot of what we did at the church I was at when I talked about the pastoral care. They have additional training in order to help people and care for them. So, but good questions. Do we have any other comments? Ken, can you characterize as you've been getting to know Montgomery County? Yes. What are the needs for chaplains in Montgomery County? Well, I'll tell you, um, I'm really excited. Um, we, I'm, I'm getting involved with Montgomery County Sheriff's. I'm already involved with Houston Police Department. Um, and in Montgomery County, we have a huge need for law enforcement chaplains. Huge need. And I'm working with the department with some people over there. Um, I believe with regard to what we're doing here at Grace, to be able to go into our local community, train up the local community, and then look for people that would have an interest in law enforcement chat. We are working with an organization called the Stronger Alliance. You may, if you go to uh, strongeralliance.com, I believe, they did a movie called The Stronger Movie, or We Are Stronger, that's dealing with military veterans dealing with post-traumatic stress injury. A moral injury. The Stronger Alliance uh, uh, director is Bruce Stewart, um, and Carla McDougall with Reflective Ministry and is the director. And Robin McMurray, or Robin Murray rather, is the author, the writer for the movie itself. Uh, so law enforcement, military. We're working with Cassidy Join for Hope. Uh, Kim Hess and her team. Her daughter Cassidy died by suicide as a teenager by hanging. We want to bring training into the school system in Montgomery County. Work with a couple other foundations and stuff to try to raise support for this training. But we want to pull all of these players together in Montgomery County and build a model that I believe is going to be a national standard. That's my, if we're going to do something for the kingdom, why not? Um, and I want to be able to take what we're going to do as a school and with this combination between Care Force and Grace School of Theology uh, to build a model that we can take throughout Texas and into the rest of the nation. What does the scripture say? You start in Jerusalem, then you go to Samaria, then you add in those parts of the world. Well, unfortunately, my Samaria has been, I, I joke, I have one time zone. It goes from the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, literally, we got about 70 chaplains out of here that are embedded in the community like I'm describing. We got chaplains out of California, then one here in Texas. We want to build it out here in Texas and Caesar because they get a lot of codes in the middle. So I'm a happy thing for them. But we covet your prayers and really want to encourage you. All the courses that our nonprofit does, by the way, we, we take it all over the country. So if you are involved with a local church, that would have an interest in us bringing the training to you, we're very happy and we'll be excited to do that uh, because we're also uh, creating pathways as people take courses through our nonprofit. We're encouraging everybody to, at a minimum, become an audit student at Grace. 
if you decide that you want it, because that's the lowest barrier of entry, and it's the easiest way of getting, getting interest. If you want to go on and get a degree, then you simply have to convert later. But what we're also looking is if I have a three credit class, and say, for example, our, uh, we're, we're putting a new course together on suicide prevention and intervention. So the suicide, apply, applied suicide intervention skills training is a two day, 16 hour class. That will be part of 135 contact hours for three credits. So if you took 16 hours with our nonprofit, we're not going to have to have you take that same 16 hours over again inside the 135 hours. So we would, we're going to, it's not in place yet, but we're going to be working on a pathway for you to ascend, if you will, into deeper learning and deep, deep, deeper degrees without having to have repetition. Now, there might be some people out there that never want to get a degree. Well, that's great because we offer national, international certificates that are recognized. So if your endeavor is you just want to volunteer as a chaplain with an organization and you want to get better equipped, we can provide all the certification you need. And we literally are a one-stop shop because of everything that we have in our organization. That's what I've been building since 2000. A lot of opportunities. Yes, sir. One suggestion I've, I've heard several folks mention how they are just interested in finding out what kind of chaplaincies are available in the government country. I've built a resume that's sort of a uh, generic resume that I've put out on Indeed.com, mm -hmm. which is a hub for all of the job banks. Uh, sure. And when you get a notification, that tells you all yes. of these chaplain programs yes. that are out there in a lot of the hospitals and uh, just yes. a number of LinkedIn uh, is another one, Facebook is another one. It's they a good all way to recognize what's out there. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that. Are you aware that there's a uh, new nursing program coming in across the highway from a degree nursing programs? Well, I think they, I don't know if they have RN programs here yet. Okay. I know they have some LVN programs, but I just saw in the, I think it was the Impact Magazine, the last one we got, that one of the schools that has a campus somewhere else is moving their whole campus here for registered nurses wow. so that they can use, now that we have five hospitals, right. you know, they can do pediatrics right. and med surge and everything right, right here. Right. Um, so they're they're moving here. That might be a golden opportunity wow. for the school to link in. That would be great. Because as a registered nurse, I can tell you, I could have used this all my career. Yeah. Is everybody you dealing with yeah. is the is a crisis? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it from the nursing staff. If I was in a NICU, a neonatal intensive care unit, and I had a baby death, mm. oh my word! And you're the staff working with the baby. Can you imagine? That, that's huge. I, I was a uh, I did. Uh, Part of my background is I have a degree in laboratory history and psychotechnology. I ran laboratories and I was also doing histology, so I did autopsies. Okay. And I got to tell you, even lab personnel having to do an autopsy on a baby, do you know how devastating that is to have to do that? Think about the law enforcement community that has to go out to a SIDS death or the fire EMS that have to respond. And have to walk into that situation with the family having to deal with the death of a baby. That, that destroys anybody. Now, to think about a chaplain that has maybe had some prior exposure, that understands what those people are going through, even though they don't understand what they're going through, to be able to come alongside them and simply love them, allow them to emote. <laughs> Be willing to let them verbally throw up on you to get that poison out. Because that's what needs to happen. They need to get called cathartic ventilation. Catharsis means cleansing. Ventilation means breath. Cleansing breath. They need to get that out of their system. They need to tell their story. And trust me, they would tell their story over and over and over and over and over again. And you can't stand there like it's the first time you've ever heard. Because that's what they need. That's a normal thing. I remember I was at I was teaching at our church, and I had somebody come and say, "You need to get over this house." Uh, and it was a husband and wife from our church. He happened to be retired law enforcement, but he was also part of our chaplaincy. Their next door neighbor had the father and the daughter's boyfriend out in the dune buggy, 
and the father stopped the dune buggy because he had forgotten to put the seatbelts on. The boyfriend put the seatbelt on, but the father didn't. They hit it, he got ejected, snapped his neck and died. I'm notified. I go to the house. The next door neighbor to this husband and wife chapel from a um, retired law enforcement. I walk in on the sofa. I have the boyfriend. I have the daughter. The, mom. the boyfriend of uh, the daughter is has what's called a thousand mile stare. She's physically present, but mentally wasn't there. She didn't even recognize anybody was in there. And she glanced up and she, she, she had just seen her father. She glanced up, saw me, and she recognized I was present. And she looked at me and says, I can't remember what dad looks like. She had just seen him an hour ago. That's normal. The boyfriend is sitting next to her. I should have died. I'm at fault. But so that's survivor guilt and false guilt. We were no response. The husband was an entrepreneur. He was having issues with his business partner. The wife's response is, I need to call the business partner because I need to get rid of the business. Because that's what my husband wanted. Not a good idea to make a major decision with crisis. That was a normal response. But if you didn't know any of that and you walked in, how would you, well, let me sit down here and pray with you, right? They had me, our, their next door neighbor, went on and got a case of insurance. Right, to make sure they got some protein, they instead we're going to stay with them, we're going to be able to minister to them to take care of them. I remember there was an instance uh, in, with law enforcement chaplaincy that uh, a PIO of the agency had been at Disneyland and had with his kids and had a massive uh, heart attack, he dropped to the ground, did not die, dropped to the ground. Came to the hospital, the chaplain corps was called from the NCAA's room. And there was 24 7 chaplains in there for that family. There was only that person was in the hospital. And all we did was we drove them, we picked up groceries, we did whatever they needed. That's what we did. That was ministry. That's what a chaplain does. And I, it's exciting to be able to be equipped to be able to do stuff like that. And to represent the kingdom in that way. Because I believe that that's a loving heart in the hands of Christ. So uh, I, if there's no other questions, I want to go ahead and let you guys go and just thank you for the, your attentiveness. And I hope this was beneficial to you. I want to thank those that are in the Philippines and also Alabama. I failed to acknowledge you guys. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but thank you for attending as well. And I hope that some of this is going to interest you. I'm hoping to talk with Myra there, maybe even come to the Philippines at some point and bring some of this training to the Philippines. So thank you all for being here and thank you for those out. Another dozen online. Okay. And thank time. you for those that are online also that I can't see because I guess you're on Facebook over Mevo here. So I appreciate your attentiveness. And if you want more information, if you go to CareForce dot us careforce.us you can download our course catalog there and also if you click the link that says archives you can go back and look at all of our prior training we're trying to do one of these each month as a free seminar service to let people know about uh, what we're doing here and also to provide some equipping for you so perhaps there are some things you picked up here that you can make a difference in the lives of those that are around you so I thank you, and I wish you a good night. Stay safe. God bless. Ken, could you uh, secure us with a prayer? Kenny? I'd be happy to. Father, we just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to have met you this evening. I thank you for each person that is here. I thank you for those that are overseas and for those that are online. Lord, I pray that you do help us to think thoughts after your thoughts, to see things as you see them, to hear things, to feel things, and to do things as you would do, because you are our model. We ask that your Holy Spirit that dwells within us would continue to empower us to do the work that you called for us to do before the foundation of the fabric of the creation of the universe. We thank you, Father, that your presence is imminent in our life, and that you love us so much that you sent your Spirit to dwell within us for those that believe. 
So I pray for safety for each individual, wherever they are. And I pray for your presence of your spirit to go up before them and prepare the path that each person is to walk in. And I ask, Lord, that whenever we do here at Grace or within Care Force, that we may cooperate with your will and your desire in their, in their lives so that we may help you to fulfill, help them to fulfill the call that you have placed within them. So thank you for this evening and thank you for these dear ones. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.